Good afternoon. So I think we're slowly going to start. Some people will keep joining. So I'm going to start slowly by introducing myself and thanking you for joining us this afternoon, I guess, for most people. Um, so I'm Marie Baton. I'm the lead of the Europe program for CLASP. I'm, maybe I'm going to start with saying who's on the line on our side. We have the study team, so that's Yudaj Chikovic, oh, <laughs> for um, the, the leading the study, Edward Toulouse and Pia Westphalen. Uh, so these three people form the study team and they're all with us today. Um, and my colleague, uh, Jenny, who's with communication and will help anyone who has uh, any technical issue during this workshop. Um, maybe you, well, you probably have noticed that you're all muted as you enter. We'll have q and sessions and uh, we'll unmute uh, when needed at this point. And myself on the line, so I'm the lead of this study. Maybe a few words about this study while the last people arrive. Um, just to say that the idea is really to, it's kind of solution oriented. We, uh, so we, we knew that uh, the, the question of online, the online market is increasingly important and that it has its specific challenges. So that's why um, we wanted to try and identify and understand the issues in online well, compliance. I'm going to use, and we're going to use compliance knowing that we are not MSAs. We're not, we're not trying to uh, enforce anything, just really to better understand the issues and propose solutions. So um, no really trying to quantify, definitely not trying to name and shame, but really solution oriented. So that's for the spirit of the study. And that's also why we have invited all of you uh, experts to try and um, yeah, to, to ask for your contributions and thanks again for joining to define together a bit further these solutions. I see that we are slowly reaching the total amount, uh, the total number of registered people. So that's great. Thank you again for being on time. Um, so again, you're, you're all muted. The way um, we're gonna um, run this workshop is that I'm gonna do a real quick introduction of class that should be just a few minutes. Then uh, Yulaj is going, going to present the study, so introduction of the study and methodology. That will be about 15 minutes. Then we have a short Q&A question, uh, Q&A session, and then I'll ask you to use really the Q&A tool. You should all have a button, um, I believe, at the bottom of your screen. Um, not the chat, we're going to uh, ignore the chat mostly for this workshop, uh, potentially just share a few links if, if relevant, but we'll re really focus on the Q&A session because, um, tool because it's, it's easier to follow the questions. Um, also, this, the, the meeting is being recorded. Should you either not feel comfortable with that or uh, not have the time to express your contribution, of course, feel free to follow up with us individually afterwards. Um, preferentially by the end of the week, are we trying to finalize the study? But um, you're of course welcome to reach out. So um, yeah, after Yudaj presents the, the study, introduces the study and methodology, Edward is gonna um, present the preliminary results. And there again, you have about five minutes for just clarification questions. Then PI is going to present their preliminary recommendations. And I'm sorry, I'm gonna turn my video on. So that's a bit more personal. Um, Pia is going to present the preliminary recommendations. Then you will also have five minutes for uh, clarification questions. And then we will open really for uh, a discussion. And yeah, well, we'll, uh, we'll say more about how, uh, what the rules are gonna be when we're so far. So I'm gonna start with that short introduction of CLASP. If, okay, I guess I'm gonna use the buttons. There you go. So for those of you who um, 
don't know us yet, uh, you might have looked us up um, before in this meeting, but so we are, um, we, we focus on improving the efficiency, the energy and environmental performance of the appliances and equipment that we use every day to accelerate our mission transition to a more sustainable world. So we're um, a nonprofit focusing on uh, working with the European Commission in Europe and other economies. Um, so we do that. We have two main teams in CLASP working also together in some projects, uh, the climate side and the clean energy access side. So the general goal remains the same. The general mission remains the same, but uh, the levers are sometimes a bit different and the, the, the approach is a bit different. But always with the idea to to help develop affordable appliances and lighting. This is a quick overview of where we work and uh, whether it's rather climate, so on-grid kind of oriented or off-grid or both. So as you can see, um, European Union, but also more broadly across the world. Um, I should say that on this study, particularly uh, Europe is, um, more advanced than most or all other economies to put in place a framework for um, the online market. So, so well, we're hoping to um, use the best practices in Europe to help the rest of the places we work in to put it in place in a, an efficient way. Okay. So this is just the way we do it all. <laughs> In a few words, so we focus on uh, quality, energy and quality standards, compliance and testing. We have a few projects in all of those with each of those focuses on labeling and consumer education awards and production recognition. Production recognition that's a little bit less of our focus in Europe, I guess. Um, and um, same for procurement and incentives, um, a bit less in Europe, but as I was just saying, global co collaboration and knowledge sharing. So we're, I guess in, in Europe, we work mainly on eco-design and labeling. So that would be, that would encompass the three uh, types of actions, uh, the th three first types of actions that are on this slide. And we um, use the knowledge from Europe to share best practices around the world and vice versa, if we see. Anything else? So um, just a few words more specifically about this webinar. Um, this is, so as you've noticed, uh, invitations only. We have not publicly promoted the, the workshop because we really wanted to, um, to, to have experts and there will be a follow up, a public, a more public webinar, probably in April to be confirmed. Uh, that will be more for dissemination where the, the audience will be broader. But this, uh, this event today is more to actually finalize the research. So um, more participative in nature. So the, the target audience and participants that we wanted to have were um, people from MSAs, retailer associations, suppliers associations, and a few selected experts, people whom we know uh, have been actively engaged in these topics. So yeah, the goal is really to, um, to share the preliminary results and recommendations with you, but also mostly to get your feedback and comments and any additional contribution that you may have. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to hand over to Yurai. Um, if, yeah, if you yes. want to add a few words about today, go ahead, but otherwise. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mary. Good afternoon to everyone as well uh, from my side. And maybe if you go directly to the next uh, slide, I will follow up on this introduction. Basically, I wanted to say at the beginning that this is indeed a, a study where we tried to put more light into what is the compliance level of displaying the energy label and the related information on 
online sales and the main uh, motivation for this was to facilitate the transition to the new requirements and to help ensure a high compliance rate. As you can see on the table we have been on the screen we have been looking into the uh, five product categories which uh, have the currently so to say the old energy label but uh, they will be very soon a subject to the new label so in our monitoring we had a look uh, into the old label but uh, we also uh, paid very close attention to the possible changes that will come into place with the new energy label. So we looked into the refrigerating appliances, washing machines, dishwashers, light sources and televisions, and monitors and all of the uh, relevant subcategories as well. If you go to the next one, uh, thank you, Mario, already for the nice introduction. So um, we have been working on this uh, in the team uh, by uh, Pia Westphalen from Denmark and Eduard Toulouse uh, from France and myself. I am based in the Czech Republic. And also we work together with Sophie Atali in the uh, quality assurance uh, position, helping us to, to put the study into the right shape. And uh, once again, also thank you to Marie and the whole CLASP uh, organization for uh, enabling us to work on this topic, which as we hopefully will be able to show that it's indeed a timely and important issue to have a look at. Thank you for so the next slide. So uh, where exactly and when have we been looking into the e-shops? Uh, the project is running between October of last year and March this year. The physical, so to say physical monitoring of the e-shops has taken place mainly in November last year. And well, actually that was uh, probably the, the very best time for looking on the labeling compliance due to a combination of two reasons. One is, of course, that November is the high season for uh, Christmas sales. And also, unfortunately, due to the COVID restrictions, uh, even more people have been buying online than they would be normally doing. So we were doing our uh, online monitoring just at the time when uh, millions of people would be doing similar exercises as well. Uh, we did the uh, monitoring in uh, the following six countries, in Belgium, in the Czech Republic, Denmark, France, Germany, and in Slovakia. And there are basically two main reasons why we have been follow focusing on these countries. Uh, one reason is that they do provide a good overview of the uh, various situations such as a small country, a large country or, or middle sized country based in, uh, let's say, West, Central and Eastern Europe or Northern and Southern regions, uh, as well as various um, consumer habits in terms of using the online commerce. But also uh, our team was able to cover these countries with um, uh, speaking the languages as native speakers or 100% fluently. And the reason for that was that we were then able to evaluate all the possible descriptions and situations on the e-shops uh, made in these countries. We have uh, had a look on 12 e-shops in each of those countries, so on 72 shops. And we have divided these into the, the following categories that you can see on your screens. Uh, we selected some of the largest uh, e-shops, e-shops focusing on the low price, so on, on do-it-yourself segment, on specialized or high-end shops. On, we then we selected uh, e-shops uh, that were displayed randomly by the search engines when we looked for some appliances and one price comparison website from each. Uh, country. Uh, within all of the uh, subcategories, the specific e-shops have been uh, selected randomly. Uh, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, selected those uh, by knowing, uh, for example, what would be the largest e-shops, but they are not uh, specifically the four largest, because of course that information sometimes is not uh, readily available. But uh, given this selection, probably we have uh, a very high market share uh, covered by our search. If you can go to the next one, please. Uh, 
just to say it's probably very uh, obvious, but uh, hopefully uh, we wanted to show it as well that the timing of the, uh, the project was very important because uh, the importance of online commerce is uh, ever increasing. There are some statistics which are showing this for Europe uh, as an average, but also for uh, the individual countries that we covered. And uh, uh, also, as I mentioned before, the uh, unfortunate correlation with the COVID uh, means that even more people were buying in uh, the late 2020 than they would be normally. So the importance of online commerce is uh, very clear. And if you go to the next one, also uh, it's uh, very clear that the energy label as such is an important aspect uh, when people are buying online because um, various research shows that the uh, labeling information is one of the key parameters that they are considering when they are buying products, so not only the price or the color of the product, uh, but also the label. And so therefore it was important to, to have a look if the label and all the related information is available when buying online. If you go to the next one, please. Uh, so briefly, what we have had a look at, uh, we divided our activities into two steps. Uh, we call it internally step one and step two. Uh, in the first step, uh, basically, I would say, start by saying that we looked into every single uh, requirement in the legislation concerning displaying the label and the fish and the related information by uh, the legislation and a few more aspects. So in the first step uh, that was covered in all of the 72 shops, uh, we looked for those all of those five product categories with uh, 10 selected models per each uh, category of the, the product, which means altogether more than 3000 models. Uh, the basic things we looked at was of course the, the display of the energy label on the product page and on, on the eShop catalog page. Similarly, also the, the nested display, the, the arrow and the energy class for the indicating uh, on the uh, product pages and other sub pages. And similarly, also the, the product fish, um, if it was displayed on the right place with the right name, uh, the proper visibility. And uh, the uh, one exception uh, for this project where uh, in addition to the energy labeling information, we also looked for the eco design issue is the presence of incandescent light bulbs. Uh, when we were shopping in brackets on the e-shops, we also looked if those randomly selected e-shops, if they also had uh, the incandescent light bulbs uh, still available to consumers. And if you go to the next slide, then in the second step, we have a look into far uh, all the, the subcategories of the requirements that uh, proper energy labeling online should mean. This was done for a smaller sample of models, but went into all the full details, such as, for example, uh, comparing if the energy label that it was displayed online on the eShop was actually the same as the uh, energy label provided on the supplier web page. If the uh, class on the arrow is the same as it was in the description uh, of the product, if the product fish is also the same as it was uh, made available by a supplier on their own websites. Uh, we have had a look into the basket pages, into comparison pages, and uh, similar sub pages where also the energy label and the fish should be displayed. So we monitored this. We had a look on uh, advertisements and, and leaflets or catalogs, uh, which would allow, uh, which would serve as, as an advertisement, as a promotion. Uh, and uh, we had a look if the energy class is properly indicated there, and also if the uh, share of the energy classes uh, would be, or the ranking would be made available there. And uh, we also looked into specific subcategories of the products, uh, such as uh, the wine coolers, as well as uh, combined washer dryers and the, the specific professional refrigerating uh, category if the energy levels are made there 
as well and on the same uh, level as uh, the more common types of uh, uh, mainstream products. Next one. Uh, in order to, to do this, uh, one of the uh, key outcomes of the project, which uh, we hope will be also actually very useful, not only for us within the project, but also later on for the wider, wider uh, interested uh, experts, uh, it's the methodology which we have elaborated, uh, which describes all the individual details for how the labels and the fish and so on should be made available. This will be also included in the, the public report that will be a result of this project. And there we try to look into uh, all the details. And uh, I think such an overview, uh, which covers both the current labels, but also uh, specifically looks into the new labeling uh, requirements, uh, isn't existing yet at this uh, level of details. Then, the next one, uh, we also organized a survey of uh, the, the stake by, for the stakeholders. Uh, several of you are participating today, so thank you very much once again for helping us. It was very useful uh, to have this information uh, available. Uh, we have uh, interviewed uh, individual e-shops that we monitored, as well as the retailer associations as well as uh, supplier associations, both in the countries of our focus and on the EU level, and uh, market surveillance authorities, again, mainly from the uh, countries where uh, we have been active with the project, but also some more have provided their views on the issues of online compliance. And uh, we have a specific chapter on, on that in the report too, yes? Next one, and so in order that we would know if uh, our findings would uh, be in line with the uh, general expectations, we also undertook uh, a quite detailed overview of other uh, existing or previous projects which have had a look on into the online compliance in some respect. You can see the overview of the existing ones, uh, of course, depending on what level of details they have uh, publicly announced. Uh, as one key conclusion, you can see the figure, figure of 57% uh, of uh, labels not being uh, done properly or at all in online sales, which was a, a conclusion of the European Court of Auditors in their own report uh, last year. So uh, you will soon see what was our own findings. And uh, if you go to the next one, this is the, the final slide for the introduction. It's just the structure of the report that we are uh, finalizing now. And in a summary, uh, the chapters that we have highlighted in blue for this webinar are uh, marking the, the most important uh, issues, uh, inputs and outcomes uh, for the project. So uh, firstly, we have done the uh, overview of the labeling requirements for online sales in as much detail as possible in a practical way, uh, focusing again both on the current labels and the new ones, uh, which will be in place in a few uh, weeks from now. Then uh, we have elaborated a very detailed uh, typology and illustrations of the non-compliance cases by the type of uh, uh, non-compliances, type of products, the countries uh, covered type of e-shops and similar. Uh, then there was the detailed overview of inputs uh, received from the survey and the recommendations, which uh, we are going to present you uh, the key recommendations that we are thinking about and where we will be very grateful for your input suggestions for first reactions and so on. Uh, the, the report, the, the document will become public. We will not disclose the names of the e-shops that we have been monitoring but uh, the general results, of course, the, the list of the countries and product categories uh, will be available in that report as well. So this is it from the uh, introduction and methodology. Uh, right after this, uh, we will speak about the results and then the recommendations. So in case of any questions for clarification on the methodology, feel free to ask.
So um, just to clarify, I'll ask you to um, send any questions, again, at this point, just for clarification, that you may have in the Q&A box. Um, and if, if anything is a bit long to explain, or um, we will unmute you. Otherwise, we'll just continue with the preliminary results at this point, and we'll have a bit more time for the discussion. In the absence of additional questions, I believe I'll just hand the floor to Edward. Okay. Thank you and good afternoon. So I will now present you the uh, results uh, of our work. And um, I will start by uh, providing a kind of overview of the overall level of compliance that we found in the shops that we've monitored. So next slide, please. So basically what we found is that most of the websites that we've monitored uh, were showing some sort of energy labeling information and were aware of that they have to comply with the rules. So that's a good news. On the other hand, uh, uh, full compliance uh, with all the detailed rules is very rare. So um, we have these mixed uh, feelings and um, just to illustrate uh, these findings, we have uh, designed a, a compliance scale going from uh, a green, which would be a perfect com compliance to red, which would be a total absence of energy labeling information. And on the graph, you can see that uh, uh, the results per um, uh, product category, so that, that's average on the 72, uh, 72 e-shops, shows that most of them are in the orange zone. Uh, meaning that indeed there is some uh, energy labeling uh, information provided, but with approximate compliance to the, the exact rules or mistakes or frequent technical problems and such. I will come to that later. Um, and so our findings are quite comparable to uh, previous assessments. And also you can see that uh, what we found is that uh, the compliance for uh, white appliances is slightly better than for TVs and light sources, which is something we expected. Uh, next slide, please. So now if we uh, show the same overall average result per country, um, Germany stands out as uh, being the best in class. Uh, in Germany, we found that uh, several uh, e-shops were uh, really great in terms of compliance or close to full compliance. Uh, but in the other countries, it was not really the case. Um, next one, please. And if we show the findings per types of e-shops, uh, the first key message is that, uh, in fact, the largest e-shops are not necessarily the best performers. Uh, for instance, we found that in our sample, the do-it-yourself uh, segment was performing better, but we have to note that uh, often these uh, uh, shops do not sell all the product groups, for example, they don't sell TVs. Uh, also, you see that the price comparison websites score uh, quite uh, bad. In fact, these price comparison websites, if they don't sell uh, products themselves, they are not st strictly speaking co covered by the legal uh, requirements to show labeling information. But of course, they, are, they have a high relevance for uh, consumer choice. So a few of these price comparison websites do show the labels and some and fish and so on. But most of them, they don't provide uh, much about uh, uh, energy labeling. Uh, next slide. So what we've done also is uh, to um, try to categorize all the different types of uh, non-compliance or issues that we have found during our monitoring. And we've done this typology of compliance and we've grouped them into uh, uh, some main groups that I will go uh, through quite quickly now. 
um, just to give you a flavor. So first group of problem was were related to the availability of the energy labeling information and related information. So obviously the first problems, if I go from uh, left to right on your screen, uh, first problem is the, uh, the absence of uh, energy label altogether. So it can be full total absence of energy labels or frequent absence, for, ex for instance, when, when we were checking 10 models in the specific uh, categories, we would find four or five labels missing. Uh, same for the product fish, uh, and that was quite frequent to find no fish uh, or a lot of fishes missing. Um, another very frequent problem is uh, the absence of the, the energy labels and, and fishes on certain pages. The, the regulations clearly states that uh, on each page where you can see price information about the product model, there should be also the energy labeling information. Um, I'll come back to, to it later, but uh, basically uh, very frequently uh, there was an issue here. And the last also quite frequent uh, issue was in uh, the interpretation of, of where the energy labeling uh, information should be placed and the size and so on. So we had quite a, a large number of e-shops where it's uneasy to access the information because it's, it's either very far away from the price or it's very small or you have to scroll or, uh, and so on. And next one. So a second group of problems uh, were related to the readability of the information. Uh, quite surprisingly, we found uh, many incorrect formats for the nested display arrows. So these arrows uh, are a possibility that eShop can use to uh, um, display the energy label only after a click. But then this nested display should have a very uh, clear format. And even in the regulation, we can find uh, pictures how they should uh, look like uh, in terms of format. But then we found uh, a lot of uh, strange uh, arrows like uh, red arrows or strange sizes or, or format or arrows with information that shouldn't be there. So a lot of creativity there. We also had sometimes readability problems on the labels themselves, correct labels where the information cannot be read or strange colors uh, sometimes due to Pro, uh, potentially to uh, incompatibility between picture formats. Uh, so the one you see in the middle that is a bit uh, with str strange blue and, uh, and red colors. Uh, we also found some on official European Commission uh, documents. <laughs> it happens quite uh, often. Uh, display problems, for example, uh, when you click on the arrow, it opens a pop-up where the uh, energy level is, is much too large or tiny and you can't read it. And the same goes for the product fishes, especially when they are displayed as uh, images, they can be very small and illegible. Next one. And the last group of problems that we've uh, uh, spotted uh, was in the step two of our methodology, if you remember, that's when we check the accuracy uh, and consistency of the information. So not very frequently, but in some instances, we found uh, differences between uh, the label shown on the shop and the label of the supplier for the same model. And probably this happens when the uh, retailer, the e-shop could not get uh, the proper label and try to redo it himself or uh, done a kind of homemade version, but then there can be discrepancies between the two. Also, we found some instances of discrepancies between the information on the arrow and on the label. Here you have an example, the arrow says A triple plus, but the label is only A plus plus. Um, a last problem that we had frequently with washing machines was uh, uh, illegal claims. Uh, uh, I have just to explain that for washing machines, most of the products are in the A triple plus class. So no more room for uh, distinction. And uh, a lot of uh, manufacturers and retailers starting advertising their products with A triple plus minus 10% or minus 20% and so on. And it leads to very 
confusing uh, situation, as you can see. And the last one, something that we haven't checked systematically, but we couldn't find sometimes, is kind of misleading advice or claims like uh, buy an A plus and you will save energy while A plus is currently the least performing on the market. So hopefully this will uh, stop with the new energy labels, uh, but uh, we could uh, spot some of these. Next one, please. So uh, in the report, uh, we are going through all of these different cases and trying to describe them in detail, discuss uh, the severity of the problem, the, the impact, also the potential cause, and whether there will be change with the new labels. Uh, due to time constraints today, I won't be able to go through all of, the, of this material, but you will find it in the report and also in the full version of the PowerPoint that we are presenting today. There are more slides about all these different cases. Just as an illustration, I will quickly go through uh, the uh, cases that we were most often found in our monitoring. So as I said, the um, absence of the, the energy labels first, but uh, this was not so frequent. So just to give you an idea, about 8% of uh, uh, the shops we monitor had no label at all, and about 15% had frequent lab labels missing. So that's not too much. But for, as regards the product fishes, here we had about 60% of the e-shop missing the, the fishes. And of, often it was clear that the uh, websites were not designed to uh, display them. So that's really a problem that, that could be solved. And it's clearly not a priority in terms of compliance for, for the retailers. Um, it's difficult to assess the impact because we don't really have evidence if consumers really use these product fishes where you can find the, the characteristics of the products. So difficult to know uh, uh, what the impact is. Uh, next one. So I will go quickly. I spoke already about the uneasy access to the information. Uh, the uh, regulations are, are quite clear that the information so, should be in proximity to the price, uh, uh, in the same size as the price, and appearing at first click or mouse over. And we found many instances where that this was not the case. For example, many e-shops are just putting the energy label in the product picture gallery. And you, you may have to scroll and to do several clicks to access it. Uh, next one. Um, yeah, problem of, of certain pages. Um, usually, uh, e-shops add energy labeling information on the uh, individual product model pages, where you have all the information about the model. But the information was missing on the product catalog pages, or as well as uh, basket pages before you pay, on comparator pages, on special deal pages. And there were a lot of Black Friday deals when we did our monitoring. And that, that's really a problem that the energy label information, for example, the uh, arrow uh, with the energy class is not available because a lot of consumers start to do their pre-selection of products there. So, it's important that the information is available. Next one. And yeah, I spoke about it already. A uh, lot of problems of incorrect uh, RO formats and very frequently. Next one. So just one slide about the hunt for incandescent light bulbs. Um, we found that in most e-shops, there were hardly any incandescent light bulbs are very few available, like very small stocks. But in a few cases, uh, we found, and it was particularly for a marketplace uh, website, we found some offering possibly hundreds of uh, incandescent light bulb uh, offers. And this suggests that there should be uh, more investigation on who are these kind of uh, uh, marketplace sellers who are still uh, uh, offering incandescent or halogen light bulbs, and why are they doing so, and what can be done to, to stop that? Next one. So as I said, much more details about all these uh, uh, cases in the report and in the full uh, PowerPoint presentation. Next. 
And so that's my last slide uh, about uh, to give you a flavor of the uh, results from the survey. And I'm sorry because it's uh, quite packed with information and probably the text is too small to read because it's quite challenging to summarize that. But we are very happy to receive more than 30 surveys from all the different uh, types of stakeholders with very interesting uh, input. Just in a nutshell, and that's very, very nutshell, uh, there's much more uh, and you will be able to see that in the report. But the retailers that answer to us basically says that they, they appreciate and they understood that there are energy labeling rules in the EU. Um, they, are, they welcome uh, guidance and uh, information to uh, understand how they have to comply, uh, especially uh, with regard to gray areas. And they highlighted some uh, potential issues. So a few of them was that sometimes they have some website design that uh, do, do not really uh, easily accommodate all the information. Sometimes they have trouble uh, hunting and chasing the, the suppliers to get the labels and fishes in time. Um, they understand that there is an issue with marketplace uh, sellers because they, they, they need to uh, inform them and uh, oblige them to comply and provide the information. Uh, they also raise the issue of mobile applications because uh, there should be solutions how to show all the labeling information on small screens. And also they raise the question of the other market players. Uh, I mentioned the uh, um, price comparison websites, but also the search engines, they more and more provide information about product model with price and so on. The suppliers, they said that they have a good common, uh, information flow with the retailers to, to provide the necessary documents. Um, they also welcome information campaigns to help um, retailers to comply. And uh, um, also they recommend continuous market surveillance efforts to make sure there is a level playing field. Uh, and the market surveillance authorities who answered us say they have generally a positive experience in helping the retailers to comply, but sometimes lengthy reactions. And they also consider that most of the uh, non-compliant cases that I've presented are non-intentional, which is rather good news. And on other tools that they can use, such as <laughs> web crawlers and April, uh, we will speak uh, more later. So that was my last slide. So again, if you have uh, clarification questions, uh, you are welcome to ask. Thank you so much, Edouard. I, again, don't see any question coming in in the Q&A. Um, so just a reminder, I, I think two or three people joined uh, along the way. Uh, we're not using the chat for questions, we're using the Q&A tool um, and you should see a button for that at the bottom of your screen. So if you have any short question for clarification right now, you're welcome to type them in the Q&A and otherwise we will go to the next presentation, which is uh, the preliminary, preliminary results with Pia. Give you just a few more seconds, but otherwise we'll have anyway a longer discussion after PS presentation. So, well, thank you again. Oh, there you go. One question. Uh, the issue on marketplace and the obligation for price comparison, are they not within the regulation? Um, I'll let, I know, Juraj, uh, Edward, or Pia answer that, but yeah, not for comparison. So please repeat. The question was whether they are the, the issue on marketplace and the obligation for price comparison. I guess price comparison websites to uh, display the label. I guess are they yeah. not within the regulation? Yeah, the the targeted person by regulation is the seller. So marketplaces are as such not exempted. Um, for those goods they sell themselves, they would be obliged. But for when they only host and facilitate selling, then the seller is uh, the ob obliged party. Price comparison sites, as uh, Eduard also mentioned, typically they do not sell uh, themselves. 
and so they are not uh, a target to the regulation. But yeah, so that what, may what be we a... have seen, what we have seen on on price comparison websites is that uh, usually they provide uh, energy the energy class as a text. So in the product characteristics, you will find just mention energy class A, A plus, etc. But very rarely the uh, actual energy label or uh, the arrow, uh, but a few do that. So it means technically they could do it, uh, but uh, most of them are not. And uh, of course, it's, a, it's an issue if uh, consumers use the price comparison website to make a first selection of their products. Yeah, so that is, um, as, so uh, Yona is uh, following up with saying, but now several normal online sellers work as marketplaces and the information is very often missing. So while well, that kind of clarification uh, that may actually be something that we can get, discuss further in the recommendations, I guess, um, because that is one of the issues that were identified. So. We'll come back to is, that, yeah. Yeah, we'll come back to that. If there is no other question, I guess we'll go to Pia. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you again, Edward. And yeah, well, yeah, there you go. Thanks, yeah. Yeah, hello and uh, good afternoon to everyone. I'll take over to present some of the preliminary recommendations from our team based on the observations uh, during monitoring and uh, having an aim to reduce the challenges and increase the compliance rate. So please shift. Sorry, yeah. We've uh, categorized the recommendations into five uh, subcategories, being uh, informational uh, recommendations, uh, recommendations from an organizational point of view, some recommendation on technical solutions, and finally also regulatory changes uh, we, we could recommend. And finally, uh, also future rec uh, research recommendations uh, for further seeking further knowledge. Yeah. So related to informational recommendations, these are first of all um, related to development of guidelines uh, being also highly requested by market actors. We recommend such to be very hands-on and to the point, uh, using high level of illustrations of do's and don'ts, and for them not to be very comprehensive text documents. Uh, they should also be uh, supplied in, uh, in local language uh, for retailer staff to be able to uh, easily understand the messages. <clears throat> Another recommendation uh, is to use individual communication and guidance uh, wherever possible, and at least uh, communicate directly with market actors during uh, market surveillance actions. We highlight also um, the MBEs. Also, Although it doesn't clearly come out from our monitoring, uh, MB&E retailers are difficult to identify and reach and uh, to inform about their obligation. So I recommend it is to include these to a high degree in uh, market surveillance actions and to uh, engage with them through this and of course, target them with uh, detailed information. In addition, uh, we recommend also to uh, public, publicate uh, inspection plans and general results to create awareness among the market actors. This is uh, deemed uh, to be beneficial. And in general, high level of communication with and information to market actors and 
organizations is highly recommended. Yeah, next one. Yeah, organizational. Um, this is uh, organ organizing at the market actors. Uh, here we recommend for retailers to ensure the same level of knowledge and uh, compliance within all product groups, perhaps having different managers. Um, so we recommend for retailers to consider the requirements already when creating the webshop and probably properly um, inform all uh, managers of the individual obligations. Uh, it is also recommended for retailers to create robust routines uh, in their organization to ensure the compliance. Uh, possibly to detect when a label has not been supplied and not uh, been accessible to retailers, that they have procedures in place to actually request these and obtain the label, which they need to be able to comply. The marketplaces, uh, we already touched upon those. Um, they are, or, are occurring um, more commonly now and uh, show relatively low compliance. So this is uh, in general an area we recommend to prioritize. And uh, recommended for the marketplaces themselves is that they also ensure to have internal procedures in place to fac facilitate compliance and uh, not to cooperate with partners who do not provide uh, the mandatory content. Yeah, next one. Uh, our team also put some thoughts into uh, technical recommendations. So what we envisage is development of a ready to embed element to be integrated directly into eShops and ensuring compliance through this. Another thing um, are web crawlers. Um, they exist already, they are also used to some extent. However, um, both web crawlers and other artificial intelligence uh, still needs to be further developed. Um, they for sure can provide some benefit to market surveillance and give quick results, but they still need development to become more flexible and uh, easy to use directly by MSAs. Uh, question is also whether the web crawlers uh, are able to, to uh, uh, inspect all the details of the requirements. Will the web crawler be able to detect a uh, wrong arrow color being used or the missing data uh, in a product fish? And can it cope with all the EU languages? So. I guess there is still a uh, need for further development, but for sure this, this is beneficial and should also be prioritized. Looking ahead to uh, April uh, becoming available to public and retailers, uh, all of us very soon, um, this is seen as a as a tool uh, that could assist uh, to solve some of the issues. Uh, retailers will be more self-sufficient, uh, having access and can uh, retrieve energy labels and uh, product fees themselves. But of course, then guidance would be needed for them to know how to do this properly. And uh, actually that this is a possibility. Yeah, next one. 
So related to the legal provisions themselves, uh, introducing the new generation of energy labels will most probably be beneficial uh, to compliance. Uh, the requirements as such uh, have not been changed, but uh, given that there will be focus and campaigning uh, in general about the energy label, this will in itself be beneficial also to increase compliance. Um, the introduction of uh, We've seen from the monitoring results that introduction of energy labels in uh, tiers or stepwise introducing uh, increasing energy classes uh, in, with new uh, energy label, this clearly causes uh, issues of non-compliance and uh, introducing the new labeling scheme will uh, reduce this as a source for, for non-compliance. A uh, challenge with the new label is the transition period, of course, where there will still be for sometimes old labels, both for the product groups uh, introducing the new energy label here, uh, old products will coexist with the old label for at least nine months. And uh, other product groups are not being uh, uh, transformed into the new label right away. So there will be coexistence of the Triple Plus and the new generation label for quite some years. And so, Authorities are encouraged to focus uh, on information, both with retailers and uh, consumers. Uh, especially informing the retailers is essential as, as they are the closest uh, to inform also the consumers, um, being perhaps a bit confused about this. As for the regulations themselves, um, it would be beneficial to be more specific on the details. All the e-shops, they use actually the nested display. Um, there is simply not space to, to uh, show the full label and the fish. And so uh, the details on how to use the nested display must be very precise and specific. Uh, as an example, the proximity to the price is clearly being uh, interpreted in many different ways. So this needs to be very precise, uh, what is understood with proximity. And our observations also show that uh, eShops focus on the product page it's itself, displaying one product, uh, product model, uh, whereas uh, if you use the catalog pages searching uh, broadly for, uh, in example, refrigerators, um, the label and the product is, is seldomly shown. Also basket page and other deal offers pages don't show the energy label. So this also needs to be clarified that uh, all web pages should be included and are target to, to these obligations. Or yeah, it should be clarified that these are in the scope or not. Another issue of uh, confusion is, uh, or at least high, uh, level of uh, non-compliance is showing the range of available energy classes. This has not been implemented well and uh, may even be too difficult for retailers to understand. Um, they are not familiar to eco-design and uh, minimum requirements and neither are consumers. So question is also that if this information would be provided if the consumers would be able to understand.
Yep, to the next slide, please. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> Can you go back again? <laughs> yeah, I was, uh, I skipped some. Also the product fish, Edward has already explained uh, very much that uh, this is an area of very high non-compliance um, and clearly not being prioritized. And uh, since manufacturers put a lot of effort into preparing these, uh, it deserves also to be used. Um, so far in the existing regulation, the product fish uh, really has not come to uh, its right effect. Uh, consumers hardly know it because uh, up till now, the only obligation was to uh, enclose the product fish in the packaging. And then typically consumers will only see the product fish when they have already bought, which is rather late. So this um, is recommended that uh, perhaps to investigate uh, the relevance of the product fish with consumers uh, and then decide either to put more focus on promoting it and uh, to secure compliance, or uh, on the other hand, perhaps reduce uh, obligations in this area. Um, we also uh, recommend to consider to include the price comparison sites. As uh, Edward already said, this is a place where many consumers start their search um, and perhaps even deciding for a, a specific shop or a specific brand. Or, so, so they might even make a, a pre preliminary choice using the uh, comparison website. And uh, that's why we would recommend to consider uh, including them in the scope of the targeted market actors in the regulation. Search engines, I don't know if this would be possible, but as uh, Irwad explained, these are more and more um, comparable actually to a comparison website. So these should be considered as well in our opinion. Finally, in general, uh, we recommend to focus on the requirements having the highest impact on the consumers and their choice of product. So now please, the next one. Yeah, looking uh, into the future and uh, based on our findings, we also want to provide some recommendations on further investigations that could be made. So uh, recommended is to monitor whether uh, implementing the new generation of energy labels will com uh, improve compliance. Another thing is that uh, we focused on, on the five product groups introducing the new label, but also other product categories could be uh, investigated. The ovens uh, or rain shoots. Ovens previously had high level of uh, non-compliance due to uh, a two-step label. Rain shoots are relatively new under regulation and air conditioners, water heaters, and boilers, they are typically, typically marketed through other sales channels. So also um, information and guiding is highly recommended. Uh, we mentioned that already. So uh, for future, we recommend to develop such uh, EU harmonized, harmonized uh, guidelines making sure that the same interpretation is used across the EU, and also to ensure that these will be available in uh, all the EU languages. And then of course, ensure also an effective dissemination to inform the market actors. Yeah. 
lastly, we also recommend to do uh, further studies to support uh, future changes in the uh, in the regulatory area. Again, having where uh, looking at requirements in respect to the impact they have on consumers and their choice, and considering to simplify the level of details and make sure to clarify the gray zones existing today. Yeah, next one, please. So the key messages of uh, is the last slide from us. Uh, and uh, in general, we see that uh, energy labeling uh, and the energy labeling scheme is uh, being well appreciated and in general also well understood uh, to be import important towards com consumers. And the energy classes are considered to be useful and understandable. And retailers are aware and uh, they also uh, make an effort to implement and comply with the legal requirements. We've included, uh, finally, uh, a quote uh, we all love very much coming from a market surveillance representative saying that if uh, a strict interpretation of the, re the regulation requirements would be used, then compliance level would be probably zero. This is rather complicated and there are, uh, is a high, high level of details to be recognized. Yep, that was it. Thank you, Pia. I think I have, yeah. So um, one question came in the Q&A uh, as you were speaking. It's actually not directly on the recommendations, but rather on how the, the research was, what was looked into precisely. Uh, the question is, um, was the distance between the price indication and the indication of the energy class required for this purpose also, um, required for this purpose also included in your project? If yes, what criteria were established to assume possible conformity? And has it also, so it's a, question in two parts. Has it also been taken into account that the presentation on the website is displayed, displayed differently on different devices, for example, laptop versus mobile phone, and depends on the software settings of these devices? So I answered short answer yeah. is yes to some extent, yeah. but I'll let you develop exactly what you've looked into. Okay, I can maybe answer to, to this one. Uh, Indeed, we've looked at the location of the information on the uh, websites, and we haven't measured in centimeters uh, all the, uh, the, the, the placings of, of the arrows or the labels, but we've considered that the uh, regulation is pre pretty clear because it, it says that the information should be in proximity to the price. So for us, it means that it's a, a few centimeters maximum. So if the, uh, the arrow, for example, was on the far other side of the screen, we would not consider it to, uh, as compliant. But of course, it's uh, probably a gray area and there are retailers uh, understand that there are different ways of interpreting it. And probably some believe they are uh, compliant and it, it can be discussed. Uh, but the, indeed, we've looked at it, and it's under the uh, case that have called uneasy access to the energy labeling information. Um, when I spoke about that, I, I just highlighted a few other typical situations. For example, when retailers just uh, uh, take the uh, energy labeling picture and put it in the uh, model picture gallery, I'm sure they consider it's compliant. But then it means it, it's already only available as a thumbnail uh, in the picture gallery among a lot of other uh, photos of the product. And we did not consider this as uh, really uh, satisfying. 
if I may add on this, uh, because the, the proximity of price has been indeed one of the issues we have been discussing uh, quite in detail. Uh, on one hand, it's not so easy to define it, what is exactly close location to the price. Also specifically as the second part of the question continues, uh, what about different sizes of the screen, for example. So we have seen quite a lot of situation when if the arrow was used, that simply, simply it was on the other side of the product picture, for example. So it was on the right side of the screen, then there was a picture, and then on the left, there was the price and the other product information. So that would be easy to say that it's far from the price. Uh, in addition, we also looked into this in terms of the size of the energy class in the arrow, the letter of the class. Uh, is it, is it uh, sufficiently large enough as the uh, text of the price? Uh, that was also quite frequently smaller than the price would be. And so this combination is, a, is, is one of the more problematic areas. Uh, so that was one of the recommendations we have in our um, outcomes that the closer definition of the proximity of the price would be useful. Uh, now in the new labels also it is actually stated then that the uh, energy class uh, letter has to have at least the same size as the price information. So this is example of a clear definition, uh, but from a real life example I have uh, heard of a retailer who read this and then they say, I think 70% uh, of the size of the price letter or the font would be sufficient for us. So uh, they indeed may continue uh, with, uh, so to say, creative thinking in this. Uh, and in addition, we have also looked on the, the same uh, model pages from different uh, browsers, internet browsers. We looked at them also from uh, tablets or mobile phones, uh, specifically to see if the, uh, the display of the information and the availability of the label is the same on all of the different browsers and mobiles and tablets. And this was actually one of the problem, the areas that do not have many problems. There have been some cases when on the computer screen, you would be able to download the, or click on the energy label and on the mobile phone, the arrow would not be working if you touch it with a finger. There have been a few cases like this, but it was really a minority issue. So uh, the, uh, the proximity to the price is an issue as we have found, uh, but the, the different browsers and different sizes of the screen is not so much an issue. Uh, however, some retailers have actually indicated that for them, uh, because more and more people are buying from mobile phones, to me it's actually uh, not so understandable, but they say people are buying refrigerators from a mobile phone. Uh, and then they may have a problem to display all the required information on a very small uh, size of the screen. So uh, one of the uh, issues for us was also how to, on one hand, make the legislation very clear, uh, how to display label and the other information, but on the other hand, not to overwhelm the uh, retailers with too many obligations. Thank you, Edward and Yurai. Um, I guess that answers the question. Uh, so I don't see further questions for clarification, so maybe I'll uh, open the, the floor a bit more for the discussion itself. So uh, we're also going to use the, the Q&A tool, but you, so if you have short questions or, or uh, input, you can type there, type them in the Q&A tool. If you want to do a longer intervention, you can just ask for the floor in the in the Q&A. Um, so yeah, thanks, Harvard. So maybe um, as people gather their thoughts <laughs> about what question to ask of or what to contribute, um, well. Obviously, a uh, study team, if there are any uh, specific aspects that you want to ask questions about, uh, go ahead. One thing that I uh, have been wondering, seeing the, the results, uh, 
as we've discussed recently, was we can see that uh, Germany is doing really well compared to the other um, countries that we that were surveyed. And I know that we have quite a few representatives from MSAs in Germany on the line. So um, if ever they know what it is they're doing right, <laughs> um, if they have good practices to share and recommendations that they know is specific to Germany, um, that may be really useful to the recommendations. And, um, and more, more generally, um, to trigger some more thoughts, um, if you have reactions to the recommendations that um, either you think are not feasible or you would like to see uh, refined or you think should be prioritized or deprioritized, um, please let us know. Maybe just on that, uh, Marie, uh, I just wanted to, uh, yeah, to um, add an important note is that when we say Germany was better than the other countries, it's on the sample of e shops that we've monitored. So it might not be statistically representative of the whole country, because as you have seen in our methodology, we've targeted um, uh, the best sellers and quite large shops in general but there are also a lot of uh, small shops uh, around and there might be hundreds, if not thousands, and they may not have the same level of compliance as we've found. So just, we need to keep that in mind when we are comparing across countries. Mm -hmm. right. On the other hand, if I may add uh, in the Czech Republic, I have seen some retailers who are actually belonging to a German company. And so I would have to say that their level of compliance was clearly better than the average because they have followed the design of the e-shop that they would have in Germany as well, which means that they have specifically included the uh, labeling uh, documents and the fish documents into it assuming it's because the, the headquarter uh, requires such a level. Uh, so that was also on the positive side. Uh, maybe uh, to me, one of the surprises of the outcome was when we have been doing the monitoring and discussing uh, the real life issue, to me, one of the uh, surprises was that between some of the countries, such as, for example, between Czech Republic and France, there have been many similarities in how the retailers have been showing or not showing specific issues. So uh, some of the aspects of the proximity of the price, of the sizes of the energy classes, of the uh, corrupt labels, examples, and similar, they have been really uh, shown in, in, in several countries by very different retailers and not belonging to the same companies. So it's really general issues which have uh, validity in Europe as such. Very good. Any um, reactions on the on the recommendations more specifically? Maybe I know I stopped the screen sharing, but maybe if it helps people to um, see the recommendations to react, maybe um, let us know. And well, if I may jump into the to me. One of the questions coming out of this uh, monitoring is the product fish. And there maybe I would be interested also in the view of the participants. Uh, what do they think about the product fish in terms of its usefulness? Because uh, obviously in this project, we have not been able to see if people are looking into it, if they are asking retailers for it, and if they are uh, studying the numbers and the, and the information about the products in the document, but uh, you have you saw that uh, about 60% of the e-shops we have monitored had a problem with the fish. Uh, sometimes even we who knew what we were looking for, we had a problem to find the fish. It was very far from the price really at the bottom of the website. It had different names and also quite commonly it was actually missing uh, from the pages uh, and now I am actually only speaking about the product pages. 
Uh, I think uh, finding the fish on the basket page or the comparison pages is almost uh, clearly impossible. So this would be uh, with the quote that if we really follow uh, strictly requirements, then the compliance would be zero. Uh, so one of the examples would be finding a product fish on the comparison page or a basket page uh, is impossible. Uh, so maybe this is uh, one of the areas uh, or a question, should the legislation somehow be simplified, not to ask for this because it's uh, not used and not required and with very small impact, or on the contrary, if the fish is a useful information, should it be uh, really promoted and uh, the uh, importance of the document highlighted to both the retailers and the consumers. That to me was one of the, the uh, quite important issues that we found. Thank you. Maybe I'll, um, I'll go back to the first question we had about the, the obligation uh, for um, marketplaces and, and comprising websites and go, if I can, back to the recommendations related to that. Um, so maybe that would trigger. Um, yeah. So that would be in the regulatory solutions, I guess, to try and define a bit more what is mandatory for whom. Uh, we have a couple more questions now. Uh, one from Candice Kesho um, from Amplia. From previous studies, do you have a comparable compliance percentage for the product fish in physical shops? Do you, well, I know that, so the, the comparison with the physical shops was not the object, but I know that uh, all three of you have a lot of experience, so maybe you're able to answer that anyway. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Pia, you looked like you wanted to answer, please. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, I was trying to explain this already, but the current uh, regulatory status of the product fish, there are no obligations to show them in the shop. The only obligation is to show them uh, or put them in the packaging for, for it to follow the individual product models. So, in the shops, they are they are not active. They are not being used. Was, was this the answer to the uh, question? Yeah, um, the, the direct answer would be that within this project, we uh, specifically looked into the uh, online monitorings from the previous project. So we didn't look into the results from physical uh, monitorings. There have been some projects which also looked into that. Uh, so my answer would be uh, firstly that the, the present, the definition of presence of a fish in the physical shop is, as, as Pia said, uh, also let's say more complicated, but from uh, other knowledge, uh, there is a little request from uh, consumers for this. And therefore also often I have heard uh, from retailers who were not aware of the existence of, of the document. And they had to look uh, or going back to the suppliers individually if somebody uh, would ask for it. Uh, of course, this would be one of the areas for the April database, which would allow a very quick access to a fish and the label uh, from the April if somebody in a shop asks for it. So, so that was something we were not able to review because April was not available yet. But from other individual communications, with retailers, uh, I think this is their expectation that in a case a label is lost or uh, a fish is asked by a consumer that they would go uh, to the April database and have it available quickly and easily. And also maybe just something to add is we, of course, we ask ourselves why there was this uh, such a, a low level of compliance with the availability of the product fish and um, because some websites do provide all the fishes, so it means it's accessible for the uh, retailer, it's possible to get them from the suppliers and the manufacturers. Um, what we are wondering if is some, uh, it's possible that some e-shops consider that if the information in the fish is uh, provided elsewhere, for example, on the product page in the characteristics of the products, 
then it's a bit uh, redundant and they don't need to provide it twice. Um, in our monitoring project, we haven't checked that on the, for example, on the list of, ca of characteristics of all the product models we've monitored, we could find all the necessary information because it, it would have been too long to check, but um, it's, it's possible. And that would be interesting to know from the, the retailers and the e-shops if they are just doing that, considering that they already offer this information elsewhere and don't need to put a link to a fish. Yeah, and, and maybe related question from Joanna. Uh, we, we have a couple other uh, remarks and questions from Tim Stokes in between, but uh, since this one is somewhat, somewhat related, um, Joanna was asking, will the link to April replace the need to have the product fish in the product web page? And that is something that we discussed that it could, uh, it could make, make it accessible, um, but it's, well, it's not would, the regulation right now. But. No, you, you would still have to provide a, a link, whether it uh, shows the label or goes directly to April and show the label from there. I guess that would be a possibility, but it's, uh, it's too early to, to judge this, I guess. So it, it could be a recommendation of like, for the possible changes to the regulatory framework, um, but it's it's not the current situation that it would replace it. Uh, but it 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 is uh, a question that makes sense whether it would be enough to have this link and get rid of this uh, this obligation for for the websites so that they would have more time to focus on other obligations that are more uh, important for consumers. Yeah, and also to uh, promote the trail and make sure that it's yeah. being used uh, for, for the purposes uh, available. Yeah, so thank you. And uh, others on the line are welcome to react to these suggestions, uh, like these suggestions that we discussed, whether it would be a recommendation that would make sense for you, or if you feel strongly opposed to it, uh, to like getting rid of this obligation for uh, to, to make the fish available on the website, for example, because we would have the link for uh, via April. Um, whether that makes sense for you or not, um, we're, we would be happy to hear it. So um, thank you, Pia, for answering. I'm, if uh, that is it more or less on this question, I'm just gonna read the, um, what Tim Stokes noted in the Q&A. He says, I think the recommendations are good. Uh, one thing I'd say is that MSAs need to get serious about this. We'd not tolerate such high level non-compliance in a physical store environment, but it is accepted that MSAs need to be consistent in their implementation of the regulations across the EU. A subgroup of the Energy, energy Labeling ADCO is seeking to address this by ensuring there is consistent interpretation and guidance developed. So that is something that we could work with and could be a follow-up action. And regarding Germany, it is interesting that well-known discount supermarket has good online labeling compliance in Germany, but poor online labeling in Ireland at the moment. So yeah, one same supermarket, I guess. Mm -hmm. Presumably the German MSAs got serious about it and provided guidance and perhaps threatened enforcement. So yeah, there may be differences in the follow-up action in the level of surveillance and in the follow-up actions uh, that could explain it. And as for um, MSAs getting serious about that, it may also, one of the issues for that may also be these gray zones that we've discussed in the, in the legal framework. So maybe um, clarifying some of that and having support documents for each side um, could solve that with that uh, would the participants <laughs> agree that that would be one of the issues and, and, and that more guidance would be something that would help have more activity from market civilians? 
If I may add on this, Marie, uh, this is this really important question and thank you Tim for putting it here. Uh, the guidance, uh, you may have noticed that we have not uh, ordered the recommendations by a priority order. We consider them all important, but actually the, info, the, the suggestion on the guidance is among the very first ones in our list. And there is a reason for this. For example, in the survey, uh, there was some of the feedback we have received was that when a retailer is active in several countries and they have a specific question in this area, they would be asking locally uh, how to solve it, what would be the proper format of display. And they were complaining that in several countries they may actually receive different uh, feedback or contradictory uh, suggestions for how to solve it. So therefore the guidance, uh, which would be uh, somehow made uh, approved by various authorities in different countries and ideally also made available in different languages so that it's really available locally. Uh, and in addition, probably also uh, communicated, disseminated with, uh, in cooperation with the retailer associations, possibly supplier associations, uh, that would then be very helpful for the individual retailers. So indeed the guidelines which would be uh, explaining the specific requirements and going into the detail uh, and elaborated in a nice graphical way so that they are easy to, to read uh, by the, the shop managers or product managers that we found would be one of the very important benefits or outcomes from, uh, for, in order to improve the situation in this area. Yeah, thank you. Um, there is one more question. I also want to say if, uh, well, Tim, Joanna, or others uh, want to on the floor at this point, we're happy to have a more interactive discussion. So just type floor in the chat and I'll just unmute you. Feel free to, or anyone else. Um, so we have one more question uh, from Alin Nils. I'm sorry if I don't mispronounce it. Um, it should be very good to clarify the matter regarding close to the price. Uh, many retailers have problems with getting the product fish. Important to inform them that the manufacturer has an obligation to provide them. And a special product fish not hidden in a brochure. So I don't know if the hidden product fish um, in a brochure is something that you've encountered during your surveys. But yeah. One more thing to yeah, maybe just yeah indeed indeed we uh, found that sometimes what the uh, e-shop uh, called product fish and link to was in fact a more kind of uh, consumer oriented catalog with uh, information about the product some uh, pictures and at the very end maybe the last page was uh, with the uh, product fish information but it was not as such. Uh, the exact product, product fish. So there is also some gray areas there. Good. Um, so Tim Stokes uh, asked for the floor, so I'm just, I unmuted you. Thanks, so you Mary. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I, I suppose just to elaborate on the um, issue around, I think the, sort of the fundamental problem here for some time has been around guidance. Um, and having a clear position on what uh, constitutes compliance. And that's taken some time for the MSAs to come to a common position. Uh, but I think we have arrived at something that we broadly agree on now. Um, so that is really a good sort of good starting point, but it is quite recent. So um, the next step really is to make sure that everybody is um, using that guidance uh, that it's absolutely clear and everybody agrees with it um, and then I think that's the point you know we once we've actually got that guidance out to retailers and SAI the organization I work for in Ireland um, we've already done that we've already developed some guidance which we think is quite clear and are beginning to engage with retailers I think once we've got that out to them um, yes I think a bit more patience may be required uh, in terms of getting compliance from retailers because it's a harder job to get compliance in an online environment than it is in a store environment. But nonetheless, 
as I mentioned earlier, I don't think we should be tolerating non-compliance um, online, especially with the way that sales are going. So our view is that we will give a period of grace to retailers to enable them to get their their shops in order. Uh, we'll provide them with guidance to enable them to do that. We'll engage with them one-to-one -one if needed um, to advise them on you know, where things need to go in relation to their web pages. But if they then don't comply by um, a deadline, which we're, you know, we're going to set ourselves for Irish web shops, then at that point, then we have to consider enforcement, um, just as we would if it was in an on, uh, as in a sort of normal environment, or if it was another regulation, for example, um, if it was eco design. Um, so I think we're approaching the point now where um, where I think big changes can take place. The the challenge is still going to be for MSAs. Then it will probably become more about well, uh, okay, the website's broadly compliant, but actually. If you look at all the individual products on the website, and there's so many of them to look at, how can we check all those products? And I think that's where we start to get into the realms of things like web crawlers to enable us to do our work, to help us to deal with the volume of websites, because that's the problem, really, uh, for, for MSAs. It's very intensive, a very labor intensive process to uh, get down to the minutiae of checking individual products across all pages. So I think first challenge is, is to get websites broadly compliant. Um, in other words, they've got the structure within their websites to uh, enable them to label things properly and have the fish in the right place. Then second step will be um, dealing with the, the more detailed granular element of getting uh, all the products that are on the website um, compliant. I think that will be sort of phase two. And if I may comment, Tim, on this with some ideas or some things coming to my mind, <clears throat> it's indeed very important uh, what you are saying. Uh, from our uh, monitoring, for example, one of the things we found out was that the, the large e-shops, for example, were not necessarily the best e-shops in terms of compliance. So maybe this could be one possible area to look at for basically the large shops, which, which have the largest uh, share of the market. Uh, otherwise, of course, in each of the countries, there are thousands of smaller e-shops, but the uh, uh, the largest one could be somebody to, to look at. Uh, one specific area uh, are the new energy labels. That was one thing that on one hand, nobody, uh, retailers, suppliers, uh, would be expecting any problem with the change towards the new energy labels. The only question mark might be that the, the new energy classes, CDE, uh, do not have such a potential for marketing. So maybe we will have to see in a few months from now uh, if in the advertisement or in other places, also these uh, lower grades will be used uh, properly. So that may be one area to, to have a look at because one of the uh, uh, suggestions we also have is to continue with the monitoring in some format, either by authorities or in similar projects like this. Uh, and the final point that I come, comes to my mind on this is that actually we looked into the product categories, which are, so to say, traditional for uh, the energy labeling. So probably even the, the results are actually quite good. Uh, as Pia was showing, there are some other product categories which have the labels more recently. Maybe they are more sold by uh, shops which are not used to the labeling so much or manufactured by companies which otherwise don't deal with energy labeling so much and so on. So if there would be a focus on the other product categories, even lower rate of compliances may be found there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so just want to also follow up with um, Alien Niels who also requested the floor if this question uh, is closed. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Yes, good afternoon to you all and special good afternoon to Tim and Ryan Pia. Nice to see you again. I hope to see you soon in real life again. It was too long to go to ago. Uh, in Sweden, we have no really problems with uh, and labeling as a as a nested display. 
uh, if you don't look at the problem with it, it should be approximated to the price. And that's exactly as Pia said, it sh should be some kind of decision how close to the price it should be. Is it sufficient that it's just on the side so you can't miss it or does it have to be two millimeters from the price and so on? And how big has it to be according to the price? And then we have, it was partly answered before, the problem with the product fish, uh, especially for heat pumps, uh, where it usually is in a brochure who shows uh, nice homes with a warm feeling and the family sitting around the heater. Uh, and back in the brochure, you can find it on page 22, uh, the product fish. And we don't think that if it's, that, that, that's not good enough in, in Sweden. And the answer we got from the retailers is that they haven't got the product fish from the manufacturer. So it's very important to tell the retailers that the manufacturer is obliged to send them the product fish. And it should be a product fish and it should be in a specific order just in the regulation. Uh, and Pia asked how much is it used by the customer? And from my point of view, my, my thought is that you could look at different let's say heat pumps on the internet and you could print out the product fish and it's very easy to compare but then you have to find them so they're printable uh, so you can compare the products well that's all from sweden bye bye thank you uh, for the fish uh, on, on this i would say Niels, uh, our experience was that basically very often they are not available in a standardized way as the requirement is to, to have it next to the label in and next to the price with the, the name given as product fish in the local language. So this was not really the case. They were at different locations under different names and also, as you say, under different formats. So this indeed makes it uh, complicated for uh, consumers to use it in their purchasing decisions. On the other hand, I would not say, at least from the feedback from retailers, uh, at least from our, what I heard, they would not complain that suppliers would not give the fish to them. Uh, my feeling is it's more really how they design it into the website. If they feel that this would be a priority area, of course, there will be always individual cases when a fish would be missing because a specific supplier wouldn't give it. But uh, in principle, I think the availability of the document as such may not be an issue. It's really how it's designed into a web shop. Okay. Thank you. Um, just a note that Tim, I uh, re muted you, but if ever you want to continue, just re ask for the floor. Um, we, one of the things that Tim did mention was uh, what calling and I um, I was wondering so it seems like we had mixed feedback on this question uh, some some people seem to be enthusiastic about this option others less so so I was wondering if it could maybe be um, kind of a first screening and then uh, like kind of helped to target surveillance a little bit more uh, if anyone has experience with it or if you have more detailed feedback that you want to share also to the study team if you if you have had already detail, more detailed feedback in the in the interviews that you did that may be interesting to share to invite people's reaction and web calling and uh, and if there are None of that. Uh, I'm not sure how many. I know that we have many representatives from NS, MSAs on the line. I'm not sure about the supply side so much, but we'd also be interested to know um, if some of the, the 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 suggested technical solutions, like developing a ready to embed box, might be useful. Um, like what. We're talking about being more patient for um, the website to adapt than the, the, than the physical store, um, but more practically, if there are things that um, are part of the recommendations already or other thoughts you have that may be useful. Uh, uh, maybe, Ma maybe Maria can just elaborate a bit more about this concept of the universal module. 
um, just to make it clear for everybody. So what we've noticed in our monitoring is uh, sometime uh, on some uh, e-shops, on the uh, product pages, there was a module on the page called the brown speaks to you or something like that, uh, where some uh, information was available about the product and clearly it was directly fed by the manufacturer. So you are, it was clearly a, a different format and it could be additional pictures, it could be additional performance information, it could be links to uh, additional technical documents. So it seems to us that it's really possible that um, uh, there's this kind of automatic uh, flow of information and data between uh, suppliers and retailers and e-shops. So that's how we came to this idea that uh, why not uh, have the uh, market players or so maybe the supplier and retailer association sit together and ask an IT company to develop a kind of universal module. So on the picture, uh, you can see that's the small uh, green box uh, that would in fact uh, work on any website and, uh, and just go to find the information. It could be on the April database or another server where there is the uh, supplier information. And so this module would automatically get the right label, the right fish and display them the right way. So we think for retailers and e-shops, it would be much easier to comply because basically what they would have to do is embed this module onto their website and the, the module will do all the job by itself. And uh, for market surveillance authority, the guidance and the, the duty would be to check that they indeed have this module present on their uh, website. And I'm sure there are IT solutions so that this module could be uh, responsive and uh, able to work in different, different screens, different devices. Um, and that's the part of, of the kind of tools that could work with April. Uh, that would solve, in our view, some uh, many of the, the, comp the current compliance issues in terms of the format of the information, uh, the name of the links, and the, the, uh, the correct label and fishes. Uh, of course, it means that the supplier information needs to be there, so the label and the fish. So, um, but it would be more a responsibility of the, the supplier and the retailers would have less trouble complying. So we would be quite interested to have also feedback on this ID because it's a brand new ID that just comes from our, our minds and probably it needs some further elaboration and, and discussion. Uh, so in our views, there, is, there are indeed two major ways to in, improve compliance is either provide more guidance to the retailers so that the retailers do everything they need to comply with all the detailed rules or develop this kind of automated tool. And then uh, if it works fine, then it's not more so much uh, the role of the retailer to, to comply, it's just to use the, the tool. We have one uh, enthusiastic reaction from Tim already. Um, but if others want to express uh, their views. I mean, it doesn't need to be right now. Um, can, and think, can, yeah, 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 yeah. again, we can. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I'm thinking um, it is probably also interesting for um, manufacturers in that they control a bit more uh, how they like what information is provided to the consumers and, and how it may be also a bit more work for them so um, yeah interested to know again from the supply side uh, if there are reactions on that I don't know or in a few days um, we may also stress, Marie, uh, I don't know if it was mentioned <clears throat> that the, the presentation will be made available and as Eduard said, uh, there are even some more slides for enthusiasts into the online compliance. Uh, they can read even some more uh, data. Uh, so we will welcome, of course, anything that would come maybe afterwards, feel free to send us emails. Uh, just please try to make it quickly so that we would have a chance to include it into the 
report if uh, if you found it relevant. Thank you. And also thanks, uh, Tim, uh, for the, the Irish guidance. Uh, of course, uh, it's good for us that it's in English so that we can read it all. But uh, that is clearly one example of a document that I personally find very interesting, very useful, because both it has the information in it and it's elaborated in a graphically very appealing format. So uh, I find this as one of the examples of a proactive way of organizing surveillance so that every retailer has a good chance simply to learn uh, in an easier way than reading the legislation uh, what they should do and how they should do in order to comply. So that's a very good practice example. Thank you for that. Yep, thank you indeed. Um, we have one more comment from Robert Trapp saying perhaps the, com I guess the commission uh, can provide an API to EPRO from which um, the all the necessary information about a product can be read. So it's true that actually it may not be more work for manufacturers because everything could go directly, like EPRO would be some work, but then the information would be going directly from EPRO to this uh, box. Um, and the store software then only has to enable the correct display of the information. So yeah, it would be something to take into account from the design of the store website, I guess. Uh, just maybe to say that in our survey, some of the retailers, some suppliers uh, we have been discussing with said that uh, they would like to keep the, the flow of documents between the suppliers and retailers individually, so that basically the supplier is still responsible for delivering the labels and the fishes to the uh, retailers. And the April would be a very good tool then for having a, as a, as a uh, back solution in case individual documents would be missing. But at the same time, also some uh, retailers already were indicating that it might be an interesting option simply to use the April database uh, to link or download all the labels and the fish documents for their own websites directly from April. So the API uh, solution could be something for them. But uh, unfortunately for this, uh, for our project, it was too early to do anything specific because clearly, as we said, it's not existing yet for us, uh, neither for the retailers. So they don't know yet how and that could be done. And maybe unfortunately also because of the uh, early March, uh, when the new labels come to shops, uh, some time will be needed for them to investigate how the April could be used. So it won't be ever possible from the very start of the new labels. Right. But so a high. suggestion, sorry? Hopes are high for it. No. But yeah, to be followed up indeed. And uh, I guess we can look into that and also look at what other projects are doing. I, know that, I don't know exactly what is included in Label 2020, but I'm sure you know you're right. So. The Label 2020 is a project which is uh, promoting the new labels. Also PI is there for Denmark. Uh, France is there and most other countries as well. Uh, the tool or the goal is to promote the energy labels, the new energy labels to retailers so that they are aware when and how to replace them. Also to the consumers to be able to use them. And indeed in uh, probably the fall of this year, there will be some monitoring of the new labels. It could be in around uh, is it 15, 16 countries where the project is active? So uh, that will definitely take place, but uh, also to some degree, the methodology will be different uh, in terms of the, the number and type of e-shops and similar. But it, they will have a look into the presence and proper display of new labels for sure. Good, great. Um, one more European project uh, that Tim is mentioning in the Q&A. The ePliant 3 IT tools work package is looking to develop a web crawler, or I, there's potentially several, uh, it seems. One application being uh, investigated is for undertaking energy labeling inspections. We are aware of the Nord crawl web crawler by BAM in Germany. The aim will be to roll this out 
across NSAs once ready. So great. Um, that's thank you for the information. I wonder where are this one. So uh, well, yeah, there will be. Sorry? That would be great. There one question was, I wasn't sure also from the survey how easy it is for the web crawler to be turned into a new country where it would have to deal with another language. Okay. And secondly, also, if it would be really able to cover all the specific aspects uh, of the requirements, such as the provision of the scale of the energy classes and, and all the things that we have covered before. Uh, that was not clear to me uh, how detailed that would be running. It must be really great in terms of being able to look into many number of pages, but I wasn't sure, firstly, the language and secondly, all specific uh, details of the requirements if it is able to cover. Okay, um, we have two more comments and I want to be conscious of the time because we're at uh, five minutes. Um, so I'll just read them quickly and then we're gonna have to close, but again, you're welcome to follow up uh, individually with, yeah, I'll, uh, you know what, I'll start by um, putting that, going back to this slide with the, the email addresses so you can take note. Uh, so we have uh, Gandhi Kisho from FAA saying, initially the commission aimed to have the April public part information into the EU open data portal so that anyone would be able to access it using API. Um, not sure where this ten there I guess um, still same, but in a way, uh, just like, I mean, question of when that could happen, but just like the commission has this um, label um, uh, generating tool online, I guess they could themselves develop something that would create the little box that we, that we discussed, it would, I mean, it could be something taken by uh, your print projects or anyone uh, or manufacturers directly in the first time, but in a way it could be also a service that would be developed once and for all at the at the European level, at the commission level. So um, yeah, thanks for that. I think it's still, it is still true. I, I see some of you nodding. I don't know if you have further information. Uh, I'll just read, uh, so Tim's in additional input there um, so that we can soon close. I lead that work package, by the way, so I guess the one on uh, the IT tools. So contact me if you're interested. So yeah, thank you, Tim. We probably will. Uh, just like. very, very shortly on the uh, April, also the label 2020 project is actually planning to prepare a mobile application for consumers, which would be able to download data about products and make some calculations for them in terms of the running cost of products and, and compare products and similar. Uh, but clearly, because it's not available, it will also not be available from early March. And that's the same situation for uh, retailers as well. So the, the intention is there and we, in terms of the project, fully support it. It's very important thing, but it will not be the 1st of March, but hopefully soon after. Great. Well, thank you. I'm going to have to close, but uh, again, thank you so much, everyone, for all of your contributions and for your interest in participation. The, we, the study team will be integrating this additional input and any uh, anything you want to share in the coming days um, between now and uh, early next week. So if you have additional input, please feel free to reach out. Um, please don't wait too long. Or if ever it comes later anyway, we'll, we'll follow up with a more of a dissemination webinar, as I, I as I mentioned earlier, and that will be in April probably, where we will discuss um, this study and the results. But also, um, China is putting in place um, more obligations on about online labeling, and uh, and we know that some other countries are interested. So we will discuss that more broadly very soon. Um, so yeah, thank you again. Uh, Yudai, Edward, Pia, um, I'll let you the floor for a minute.
So thank you uh, everyone for participating. Thanks for the, the questions and uh, the reflections and reactions to what we have done. Uh, once again, thank you to Marie and class for uh, being able to work on this project, which uh, we found uh, interesting and useful and hopefully providing new light in this area for the new labels that will come into the shops. And also specifically thanking Pia and Eduard, those of you who know them, they, you know they are very hard working and they have been more than hard working on this project. So I'm very grateful for the team. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one final note. Uh, so we'll need a few hours to get ready, but um, we will put the, the recording and the slides online um, so that you have access to everything and can forward to potentially interested colleagues who had to miss this session. Thank you again. And um, we'll, we'll see you soon, maybe in April. <laughs> Bye now.